concentrating. I'm sorry. I can't talk and write at the same time. Sorry, I was trying to do some last bit writing here. Good to see the Lord's house tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, hope you enjoyed this beautiful day that we had. Had a wonderful day and uh, just really be beautiful outside. Somebody told me it was fall was supposed to be here in the next few days. I didn't realize it was this close to being here, but I'm welcoming it here, okay? I'm, I'm Saturday, okay? So it is really close. So I uh, hope you had a great day. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule and your day and come to the Lord's house. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. Our church appreciates it. But I, I can tell you, our, the God appreciates it a whole lot more than us. And he sees your faithfulness to God's house. And I know that he'll, he'll bless you for it. We've got an exciting study tonight. We're going to be back in Exodus. We talked about last week, maybe just hitting the high spots. In, in these chapters, so we wouldn't go verse by verse. However, Exodus chapter 14 has a lot of high spots, okay? So we're probably going to have to hit a lot of them. Probably one of the most exciting, most supernatural chapters in the whole book of the Bible where um, we see the crossing of the Red Sea and God's supernatural act there. So we'll be looking at that tonight. Uh, going to do that. Looking forward to that. Uh, I appreciate everyone that's... Uh, Reached out today to go get our pews. That's what I was writing down. I called them the pew crew, so uh, it almost rhymed. Uh, but anyway, we I think we got plenty. Uh, let me. I'm gonna call out everybody's name and, and make sure uh, Brother Josh and Caldwell, Brother Daniel. They said they both go. Brother Paul, you texted me said you would go. Brother Ethan, um, of course me. Brother Tony Vance told me he would go. Brother Stephen. Said he would go, and uh, we have two truck drivers, Lance and, and uh, Luke, and then Corey said he'd go. That puts us at 10, but if uh, we that makes eight on the crew going down. The truck driver's going to leave Sunday night about midnight to drive down, and they'll, we'll get loaded up, and then they'll drive back home. We, as the, the pew crew, we're going to leave at Sunday afternoon about 3 o'clock. PM. It takes about six hours to get to Jacksonville. Of course, we'll stop on the way, get something good to eat. I'll feed you good if you go. Uh, but, it, you know, I, I hate to work these truck drivers too hard. I think eight's enough, but if we have you know, a couple more, it sure wouldn't hurt. Uh, I would love to be able to get them taken out, loaded, and be headed back home by six, um, by lunchtime on Monday, so that puts us back here around six, uh, six o'clock or so in the afternoon. So, uh, just keep that in mind. All you guys that have, have volunteered, go thank you so very much for that. Uh, I think it's not going to be a, a job. It's going to be too difficult uh, as far as um, difficulty of the job, but it's going to be a hard job. We're going It'll be uh, a lot of elbow grease and strong backs and just uh, grunt work, but we can get it done. God has blessed us tremendously with this. I was talking to that pastor, and he said, I was just worried how in the world, what were we going to do with these pews? I said, well, while you were worried about that, God was uh, answering a prayer that we've been praying for, providing a way for us, so uh, it's all worked out really good, so we appreciate that. Uh, special prayer request. We'll take them tonight, and then we'll get started. Okay, let's remember Miss Phyllis, not feeling well. Any others? Miss 
Let's remember Miss Judy Holloway dealing with cancer. Remember Brother Dale got great news this week. Brother Dale Sal uh, is only going to have to take 30 treatments, and uh, they cut some of the chemo back, some of the treatments back. He's doing really well with it, so continue to pray for him. Thank you for that, but uh, he's doing well. Any others? Okay, Miss Shirley Craven on her back. Okay, she's having back surgery. Let's remember Miss Shirley. Brother Adam Rice is doing well. We've been praying for him, uh, one of our uh, members, and he's uh, had surgery on his kidney last Friday to remove cancer. Uh, he's doing well, got to come home on Saturday, so we're thankful for that, and uh, he's continuing to heal. Any others? Yes, Miss Olga. Okay. remember Miss August because what's her name Miss Olga? Isabel. Isabel. Let's remember her. Also Brother Tony Pitts, a uh, uh, young man that works for uh, this at Miss Katie's work. Let's remember him. He's dealing with cancer and a lot of different issues. Please pray for Anthony Pitts. What's his name? Mark Newell. Mark Newell. Let's remember Tom Harris. Remember those requests. Yes, brother Derek. pray God's comfort on that family, absolutely, amen. Uh, got a little praise report I saw today uh, on the young man, Bremen's quarterback, Carson Kimball. He uh, actually moved his pinky toe today on purpose, his mother said. So that's great news. I know it's a small step, very small, but uh, did it on purpose, yeah. definitely need to pray for our school system, pray for all the uh, school system here in Heard County and Carroll County, especially in Bowden. We got teachers in this church in every one of those school um, schools teaching. We pray for their safety, for our children's safety, and just pray that God give peace and uh, watch over them. Just hedge those schools. Uh, it has gotten crazy since all those things have happened, but uh, let's continue to pray for those. Yeah, Miss. Uh, little Percy, let's remember to pray for her. She's still having a lot of GI issues with her with her stomach, uh, the baby, Percy, so let's pray for her. All right, anybody else? Miss Olga? For, for our family, yes. Remember Miss Olga too on this day. 
Any others? Yes, sir, Brother Jeff. Uh, a lot of our country is as a lot of the faults that we have as a country are due to some of those those types of things. But I'm thankful for this. Uh, somebody asked us, we, we were having a thing a few years ago around the schools and how God we've been working and we had a big prayer meeting up at the high school at Bowden and of course the Fox Five showed up. They wanted to make a big deal about it because we was praying on school property and and uh, actually one of the 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 guy wanted to interview me, and he asked he asked me this. He said, "What do you say to people say you you shouldn't bring uh, religion into into schools?" And this was my thought was I told him I said, "Well, as a Christian, I, everywhere I go, Christ goes with me. He lives on the inside. So when I get to the schoolhouse, I can't just tell him to stay outside. He's going to come with me. They may have tried to take him out of schools, but he's still there. Amen. With our with our people, with our kids." And with our teachers and uh, you know wherever we go as a Christian he goes with us and uh, we need to be an example of that so but you're right a, a lot of the, the, the country uh, we're dealing with a lot of issues because of those types of things anybody else tonight all right if not let's go to the Lord in prayer then we'll get right into our study tonight we're looking forward to this it's gonna be good let's pray Lord we come to you tonight we thank you for your many blessings Thank you that we have the opportunity, Lord, to pray. And God, we, we've heard all these requests tonight, and you know them personally and specifically. God, we pray that you would uh, move according to your will, not according to ours. Lord, everyone that needed to ask for protection, especially for our schools, for our country, Lord, for our leaders, protect them, Lord. We pray that you put a hedge of protection around them. Lord, the one like you had around Job and his family, God. And, Lord, I pray that you'd put that same hedge around this church and around our schools and around our teachers and around our children. Lord, when they enter this evil world, I pray, God, that you would be, Lord, with us and allow us to do what you would have us to do as a church, be a bright and a shining light in a dark world. God, be with those that need a healing touch today, a comforting touch. You, you're able to do all those things. You have that power. God, I just pray that you'd lead God and direct us. Lord, as we go into this study, help us to go deeper in your word than we're normal, uh, accustomed to. Lord, this is a, something that we'll study tonight. It's something that's well known to most kids when they're in uh, Sunday school. But, Lord, it's not a, the familiar air to the story. Let us bypass the, the specific things that you want to show us tonight, something new, something that will help us and help our faith. God, I pray that you be with our revival. God, as it's coming up, God, I pray that you would touch the men that will be preaching, anoint them, give them messages that we stand in need of, and Lord, just touch the lives of those that are here. God, lead God and direct us. Help me tonight. Lord, let me be a light for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter number 14 tonight. Uh, we, we saw last week the uh, institution of the Passover and the separating of the firstborn, how God said they are mine. But Israel had left. Finally, after all these years, 430 years, they'd been in bondage. And after the 10 plagues and the nine months, the 10 months it took for Pharaoh to finally let them go, he finally said, get and get out of here. And they left Egypt, a free people. Now, imagine this. Just think for a minute. The, just put yourself in that crowd. How would you have felt if in all of your life the only thing you had known was bondage. The only thing that you had known was to be a slave. No one that left out that day knew anything of freedom other than maybe Moses. Moses died in the wilderness after he fled, but he, he still had a burden upon him. But all these people had lived for all their life in bondage, to be a slave. And all of a sudden now they're free. They didn't have to do anything. Anybody... Uh, a, a dictator told them they had to do. They were just following the one that set them free, following the Lord. Could you just imagine the the feelings that they might have had, that they might have had? Uh, what's some of the feelings you think they they had? Huh? 
There you go. That was the first one I thought of too, Kylie. Confusion, she says. How do you even know how to be free when you've never been free? Huh? Yeah, they, they were probably frightened in a way. What are we supposed to do now? Uh, confusion, fright. What's another one? Oh, you better believe they was happy. How many of y'all know two things can be true at the same time? You can be happy, but you can also be a little fearful and be a little bit confused. Hey, I'm happy I'm free. I'm Praise God I'm free. But I don't really know how I'm going to be free or how to be free. I don't know how to do that. So all those things are correct. What's another one? Relief. Absolutely. It's like getting the pressure pulled up off their shoulders. Could you imagine being shackled and... And, and yoked with that kind of uh, burden for all of your life, and all of a sudden, I don't have to make any more bricks. We hadn't talked about them making bricks in a long, a lot of a long time, but I, I'm even through all the things that they had done. I'm sure they were still things I had to do, but all of a sudden, they didn't have that burden anymore. Just imagine the freedom. Think about this: Is there ever been something in your life? And let's talk spiritually speaking for a moment. There's something in your life that you really a burden that you carried, maybe a bondage that you had, a, a, a bondage to this particular sin, and all of a sudden God set you free from it. Just think about how you felt. I've been there, done that. I've been to a place where I was. Uh, Y'all hear me talk about it all the time, but listen, that's my life story. That's what God did for me. I'm going to always say and tell you what God did, but the day that he touched me, I had all those feelings that they had. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how, you know, how I was going to go forward, but I was happy. I was burdened. My burden was lifted. I was so free. I, I felt so good. It was an so amazing feeling. That's exactly how these Israelites were feeling as they left out of Egypt there. Uh, notice what happens, though, and I'm just going to hit the first four verses. I hope you all read through it. If you didn't, I'm not going to read every verse, but uh, paraphrase the first couple of verses. The, the Lord came to Moses, and he said this, Tell the Israelites to go and camp before Pith-Haharoth between Migdal and the sea over against Belzephon, before it shall encamp by the sea, before ye shall encamp by the sea. In other words, God's guiding them now, remember? Okay? He said, I'm going to lead you. If you'll just follow me, I'll go before you in a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Just follow me wherever you're going to go. And so now he kind of gets them to, we, know, we talked about last week, this is before they crossed the Red Sea, but he didn't take them the shortest way. And even in this time, He's kind of making them zigzag, curl around, go a little crazy, and then camp. He told them to encamp by the sea. Now, there was a purpose why God did this. Look as a little further down, the, the verse 3 says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And this is God speaking. He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now, he then brought ten plagues upon Pharaoh and upon the Egyptians. But God says, "I'm not done with them yet." How many of y'all know that God, when God says He's going to do something, He's He's going to do it. And maybe some of those Israelites were praying that God would just take Pharaoh out. Because listen to this. As long as there was a Pharaoh in Egypt, there was a reason for those people to fear. There was always going to be a reason for them to say, well, we're not safe. Even when they got to the promised land or in the wilderness, they, they were, may have always been looking over their back. Is Pharaoh coming? Is Pharaoh going to get us? Is he going to send his army after us? So God knew that. So God said this, I'm going to take care of Pharaoh. And he says, I'm going to make you look like you're wandering, look like you're confused in the wilderness because you don't know where you go, but I got a plan. Let me ask you this. How many a times when God sets you free from something, are you always looking over your shoulder thinking, well, where's the devil going to come from this time? Can I say this? That's a natural reaction to the way we live because the devil is so prevalent in our attacking Christians and attacking people that are trying to walk with God. But I think sometimes that's inviting the devil to come back into our lives. 
how come we can't just be free? How come we can't just say, God's delivered me from that, and I ain't going back. And even if the devil tries to attack me, I'm, it's, it's okay. I'm not going back to that life. I'm not going back to that sin. I'm not going back to that habit. Because sometimes the Bible says this, neither give place to the devil. And sometimes when we turn around looking, where is he at? Where is he coming from? And listen, it's good to be uh, aware. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the, the, uh, Satan, is like a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may, may devour. So we need to be alert and aware. But sometimes I think when we just think, well, he's going to get me. I just, I just know he is. We're opening an opportunity for him to come. Just take, say, Lord, you set me free and you've set a course and I'm just going to follow you and not worry about where you're at behind. But God knew how people are. So he said, I'm going to do away with Pharaoh. Look at verse 5. It says, And it was told the king, of, the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? They asked this question. And listen, this is another thing. It doesn't give us a timeline how long they had been gone. If they had made it down against the sea, several days journey, maybe even a week or so journey, they were kind of meandering through there could have been a month or so that they had been gone but it didn't take the Egyptians very long to say why did we let them go because what did they need now they needed slaves right they needed servants they said we let all our help go and we now we're gonna have to make the bricks now we're gonna have to do all the things that they why did we let them go I wonder if there was some big smart aleck in the back that spoke up and said, well, I can think of ten reasons why we let them go. You're talking about those ten plagues. Uh, I wonder if there'd be somebody that stood up and said, well, I, I can, I, you don't remember all that, the frogs and the locusts and all that. That's why we let them go, because God made us let them go. But they, they said, why did we do this? So their hearts were turned. And the Bible says that Pharaoh made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. Now, for us to hear this story, we think that chariots is just a, a war machine in that time. But can I say that that was the most elite, most advanced war weapon that there was in that time. It would be like somebody now uh, in, in today's time having a super top secret spy, plane, jet, bomber, whatever that nobody knew about. It was the top of the line. It was like the M1 Abrams tank or whatever it's up to now. It's, it's like those drones that fly around. It's the top. It was the top of the, of the chain of weapons that they had. And, and Pharaoh said, send the very best, and we're going to get them. We're going to send them out. So he took off, and he took after them. He hardened his heart. My, listen, this is the seventh time now that it says that the Lord had hardened his heart. Remember beforehand, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, then God gave him his, what he wanted, and then he began to harden his heart, and this was one of the times that God hardened his heart, and he pursued after them. Look in verse 10. It says, When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Let me ask you this. I want you to raise your hand if you, uh, if you would blame the children of Israel for being scared at this moment. Raise your hand. Miss Page? You wouldn't blame them. That's what, I, I guess that was kind of, I worded that wrong. I don't blame them either. I look back and he's coming. Listen, what did we just say? That was one of the fears that they had. Where was Pharaoh coming? And they look back and there he is. Let's say this. This is also, we can... In our lives, we can kind of compare this. How many of y'all know that when God sets you free, it's not long till Satan's back after you? Pharaoh is a picture of who in the Bible? Satan. And when God sets us free from something, it's not long. He's back after us again. He don't leave us alone, very long. The Bible says this about Satan when he was tempting that, uh, Jesus that he departed from him but for a season. He left him alone for a little while, but then he came back and attacked him. The Bible talks about Israel's enemies over, over on in the Old Testament when it got into the time of David when they were fighting the Philistines, and it said the Philistines gathered together again against Israel. 
uh, sometimes our enemies and Satan especially is going to always gather back again. And it doesn't take long, even though we think we're free and we got rid of that thing and we got victory, that it, it starts attacking again. In our lives, when we get victory over something, it doesn't take long to when we, we get tempted by that thing again, we get uh, attacked by that thing again. And so we got to be vigilant for those things. But they were scared. They saw him coming, and I don't blame them. And not only did they see him coming, what did they see first? Them chariots uh, coming, wide open. The elite chariot masters, they were in front. They, there was a huge cloud and this great army that was coming after them. It wasn't just Pharaoh and a few mad people that was having to make bricks. It was the whole Egyptian army was after them, and they were scared. And they lifted up their eyes and they were so afraid. And then they cried out unto the Lord. Notice this. The very best thing they could have done was what? Cry to the Lord. Amen. They did what they were supposed to do. In faith. Saying, Lord, you're going to have to help us. Next time you see Satan coming after you, the best thing you can do is cry out to the Lord. Say, Lord, I need some help. I, I, look, he's coming back again. Will you, you set me free one time? Will you set me free again? Or will you finally get rid of this thing for me? We cry out to the Lord. But don't you see a difference here, how they cried out with the Lord? With a little faith, they cried out to him and, and, and was asking him because they were afraid. But then they also cried out to Moses. Look what they said to Moses. Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away into the wilderness Wherefore thou hast dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is, this, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Man, they cried out to God for help, and then they got on their leader and said, What would you do that for? We told you we didn't want to come out here. Uh, they, they got kind of... This is the very first time we're going to encounter this many, many, many more times how they would rise up against Moses and be angry with Moses about something that they asked Moses to do and something Moses was doing on his own. But they, were, they, they took it wrong, and they began to say some hurtful things to him. They were fierce against Moses. They said, you just brought us out here because they weren't in graves in Egypt. Now, I thought about this today. Were there graves in Egypt? Sure there were. They were there's still graves over there now, but yeah, four hundred something years. But let me ask you this. I I wondered about this. This is just an interpretation, so it has nothing to do with no profound wisdom here. But could it have been because of all the death that had been in in Egypt during those times that all the places they had to bury somebody was used up all of a sudden? And they said, because there were no graves in Egypt, you brought us out here. So, you... But what were they actually doing here to Moses? There you go. They were blaming Moses. They said, Moses, it's your fault. You did this. You... They almost acted like Moses. This was Moses' grand plan to get them out into the wilderness so they could get killed. Moses, you did this. You brought us all the way out here for the... All the time, Moses has been going before Pharaoh, just sticking up for him and praying for him and doing all this. And now they said, Moses, you, you, you just brought us out here to die. We know you and, you and Pharaoh were in cahoots. You brought us out here. They were falsely accusing him. You are so right. And that's what human, that's what human beings do. We're the, very, the very best thing that we can do is blame somebody else for Issues that we had. And listen, this wasn't even a problem that they caused. It was just a problem. But they still wanted to blame somebody for it. <laughs> That's what exactly. Most was like, man, I didn't, I, you think I want to come out here and die? Right. I mean, there you go. Yeah. yeah. It was almost like they're that what what was really on the inside was coming up now. They thought the whole time, well, we're going to get out here, but we're going to die. You know, we're, we're really not going to be free. We're really just coming out here to die. Moses, I, I know God's 
done all these great miracles and got us out of Egypt. But now I, I know since we're out here, he, he, he's probably used up all of his ammunition over in Egypt. Now he can't do anything. We're up against. Listen, I understand their fear. They were up against the sea on one side. Pharaoh's army is on the other side. For any normal human being, it looks like there's no way out. Have you ever been there in your life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think it's just truth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And th this is this is the thing. That's very that's very valid, brother Edward. You said I feel exactly the way they feel now. Looks like there's no way forward, and look like. So what are we as Christians, by knowing what God has already done? What do we got to do? We just got to trust Him. So let, let me ask you this. We know the end of the story, right? We know what God's going to do here. We know he's going to step out and spoil alert. If you don't know this story, uh, I'm going to spoil it for you right now. He's going to part that Red Sea. They're going to go across. But listen, at that very moment, they did not know that. Can I tell you something? Moses didn't know what he was going to do. But God knew what he was going to do. Can I tell you something? I have no idea how God's going to get us out of this thing. And let me say this. God may not get this country out of this thing. Can I, can I, can I share some, some truth with you? When a country turns to sin like ours has, and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, or hundreds of years, we're 200 years old, our country has been, was almost giving us too much credit, wasn't it? But 200 years, our country was founded on godly principles, on the Bible, on the ways of God. But when a country turns its back from that, there is judgment that comes, okay? You look at all the old cities in the Bible that God destroyed. It was his judgment because they would not follow him or accept his word or those things. So, listen, we can't do what we've done in this country. We can't kill 81 million babies and not expect judgment to come. We can't accept the things that we have accepted that go totally against the word of God and not expect judgment to come. Now, God is a graceful, long-suffering God, and he has been very much so from us. But I can't tell you that he's going to save this country. But I can tell you what he will do for you. Just like those children of Israel were down in Goshen, and he shielded them from a lot of the judgment that came upon that, he will shield us. Now, we may have to live through some harder times. It may be harder to buy groceries. It may be... But listen, God's going to take care of you. Listen to me tonight. If you don't hear nothing else I say, God may bring judgment on this country, but he's going to take care of us. And before it gets too bad, you know what he's going to do? He's going to take us home. We're going to get out of here. But the reason he hadn't done this yet, because there's everybody that's supposed to be in this thing ain't in this thing yet. We've got to tell them about it. But listen, they were scared. So what we have to do is just because we're scared, we've got to trust God. Just say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what you're going to do. But I trust you that everything that you do is right and just. And wherever you lead, I'm going to follow. And that's what they were saying. But they were scared. Let's go on down just a little bit further. Moses said unto the people, listen to this. I like Moses. Moses was one of the, one of the best characters in the Bible. He's a leader. This is what your leader is supposed to do. He stood up before the people and he said this. He says, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's standing up on a stump somewhere right beside that Red Sea. And he's telling him, he says, listen, I want to tell you something. You need to 
fear not. I know you see Pharaoh coming, but don't be full of fear. God's got you. Stand still and see what God's going to do. That's what every good leader is supposed to do. He's supposed to show confidence. He's supposed to show all these things. But can I tell you, I don't know how this is, this is what happened. I, 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 actually, I heard a commentator say this day, and I thought, man, that's really good. That, that's probably what happened. Because I know this is what I do sometimes. I may stand before you and say, man, God's going to take care of this thing. But in my private, I'm over saying, God, I don't know what you're going to do, but you've got to help us right now. I can see Moses standing before the people of Israel saying, stand still and watch God. Then run over and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. you got to get us out of this. God, I need you to work. I need you to move. I need you to go. And that's what Moses did. He, he, he portrayed courage. He portrayed confidence in God because he was. But at the same time, Moses didn't know what he was going to do. He also saw the Red Sea. He also saw Pharaoh's army. He also didn't want to die like they did. Like Brother Randall said, I mean, it's not like he wanted to die. Uh, I mean, I would have, I probably wouldn't have been near as good a leader as, Pharaoh, uh, as Moses because when they would have said, you, you did this, I was like, all right, well, y'all take care of it. I'll see you later. And I would have started swimming. But that wasn't Moses, and that's not what good leaders do. And of course, I, I wouldn't do that, so tongue-in-cheek. But really, uh, if most people would, would have got a, very offended at that, but he stood up. But then he went and began to pray. Look what he says. He says, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen this day, you shall see them no more ever again. He says, God's about to take care of this issue that you have. And the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And he said unto, and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou to me? Speak to the children of Israel, that they go forward. Like Brother Dan said, Moses over there praying, God, what you going to do? What you going to do? He says, Moses, what are you up here talking to me for? Just go. Trust. Do this. I'm about to give you instructions. Don't worry about it. I got it. And so many times, God just wants us to be obedient and follow him and not try to ask all these things. Listen, there's certain things that we need to pray about. But there's other certain things that, God, that we don't even need to pray about. Let me give you an example. Do we need to pray about trusting God? Do we need to pray about that, though? What? Do we need to pray about whether to trust God or not? Right. We don't need to pray whether or not we need to trust him or not. We just need to trust him, right? Uh, exactly. I probably said that wrong. Uh, propose that. that the, but we don't need to pray about those things. We don't need to pray about things that God has told us to do. We don't need to pray whether or not we should trust God. We don't need to pray whether or not we should live righteously. We just know we're supposed to do those things. There are things that we need to pray about, but not those things. And Moses is saying here, he, he's saying, the Lord is saying to Moses, Moses, you're down here praying, but what you just need to do is go, follow me. And so he, he, he tells them that. He says, it's time to go forward. Um, tell the children of Israel to go forward. He said this, lift up thy rod, stretch it out over the hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Man, that's that's an amazing thing that God says, all right, Moses, it's time to go forward. But the way you're going to do that is you're going to make a way, you're going to part this sea with your, with, your, um, with your rod. Notice what happens, though. Pharaoh's still coming. How long, how long do y'all think it took God to part this sea? A night. 24 hours. So many times we just think Moses done that and all of a sudden it went poof. And it was dry. But listen, listen. Exactly. Uh, let, let, me ask, let me ask you this. We, sometimes we're pretty harsh critics on people because like the children of Israel, especially, especially, we had already seen what God had done, right? 
We had already seen nine plagues. They had been witness to that. They had saw that. So we say, well, God had already done all that. What, what do you think? You know, what did they think he was going to do? Just leave them there? But listen to this, though. How many things have we seen God do in our lives? We are the exact same way. Listen, if you ain't done figured this out already, by the time we get done with this study, you will figure out we are the children of Israel. I mean, really and truthfully, like our actions, our unfaithfulness sometimes, our uh, grumbling and mumbling and backbiting, and that's who we are most of the time. And, and, and when we read this and God's just showing, hey, look, you're really looking into a mirror. This is, this is how you act a lot of times. Because God has done so many things for us, and we get right up against a big, a big obstacle. Did I say it right? Obstacle. If you get right up to a big old trouble in our life, and we, we oftentimes lack the faith that we should have. When, if we just look back at God's record... We know he's always come through. He knows he's always took care of us, so we should always believe, but we're just like them. We're ballistic sometimes, yes. true we got to put our faith on on the right one and that is exact, exactly God and they had to put their faith on God but look what happened um, God says I'm going to do all these things you're going to know I'm God Pharaoh's going to know I'm God the Egyptians are going to tell stories about this for the rest of your life and 2,000 years later or this is way more than 2,000 years later or thousands of years later uh, on a Wednesday night in 2024 there's a group of people going to study about this. God knows all that. And, and this is what he says. So he, he tells him to go out, hold his, his rod over the sea, and he does that. And notice this. But when they went out, the angel of the Lord that went before them in a pillar of cloud, where was he in, where was he, uh, in their vicinity? Was he beside them, in front of them, behind them? Where was he? But where was he when, when they went out? He was in front. They were leading, right? But now God changes positions. That says the angel of the Lord came from in front in verse 19. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, of, of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to those, so that the one that came not near the other all the night. So in other words, he put up a barrier between the children of Israel and the Egyptians. That pillar that they had been following, it moved. Can I say this? Sometimes God will move in areas of your life. Sometimes he's in front of you, leading you. Sometimes he's behind you. Uh, uh, holding you up sometimes he's toting you God will move his presence will move around in your different areas of your life and he will move but notice this that same pillar of cloud to the Egyptians was what somebody look what it says it was to them what darkness it was to them darkness when they saw all they saw was a darkness there uh, that great pillar was just dark and and, and, and mighty and just overpowering. I, I believe it was like the dark of night when, when the, you couldn't see anything in front of your face. It was just darkness. But on the other side of the cloud, what was it to the Israelites? It was light. He is the light. And it was light to them so they could see. But for one group of people, he was darkness. And for the other group of people, he was light. Now, I want to read this to you. This is not my words. This is out of my 
my little study book that I go by, uh, that I, I like to use, uh, but it's so profound. I want you to listen to this. The presence, power, and truth of God still gives light to some and appears as darkness to others, depending upon the condition of their heart. That struck me. That's when a preacher can get up and preach and make some people just mad and breaks other people's hearts. When, a, when, a, when God, the presence of God can show up and people can be offended by it and people can fall in love all at the same time. That's when a world can look at God and say he's revolting and Christians can look at God and say, that's my father and I love him so very much. It's according to the condition of their heart. And that's why so many outside of, of our Christian community in the world hate what we do so much because of the condition of their heart. They're living in darkness. The Bible says to those that are lost, to those living in darkness, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. But to those that know him, it is the power of God. And that's where this world is right now. There's so many looking in, and they, they just see darkness because of the condition of their heart. While we're on this side looking and saying, man, we got a good God. He is taking care of us. He's doing all these things. But it's all because of the condition of a person's heart. How does a person's heart condition change? Let me ask you that. How, how does it change? Yes. How did you get back in the light, though? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Just follow the light. That's how people's hearts change and the conditions of their hearts change. They are pierced. The darkness of their life, the darkness of their heart are, is pierced by the brightness of the light of the gospel. And they begin to hear truth and, and, and it starts to make sense. And there's a Holy Spirit shining that light, but he's using a lot of you guys to shine that light. He absolutely does. Yeah, he absolutely does. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. It, sometimes it comes to a point where you have to get to that brokenness, that broken part where you say, there's nothing else but him, right? Yeah. Mm. That's that's very powerful that you just said that because I hadn't thought about it. What was Pharaoh full of? Pride. He was a god. He'd been humiliated all these ten plagues. He couldn't do anything about it. His son... Had, had passed away in this and he was full of pride and he could not see anything but darkness toward the children of Israel but at the same time they on the other side they could see nothing but light because of what God had done in their life and for them but pride is a big thing that, that causes a veil of darkness to come across us that's very good Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm gonna ask, yes, I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable for just a moment. 
And, and listen, you won't be the only one I know. But if you've ever, if you want to be truthful or not, and if you've ever been mad at God, raise your hand. Every one of us. How could Pharaoh not be mad at God after all the things that had happened in his life? He was destroyed. I mean, we, we've got mad at God for a lot less things than Pharaoh had to get mad at God. You're right. He, he may have been mad, and, and thought, I'm just going try to try to exact as much of revenge as I can. But God had a plan. God already knew that. Look what it says. 21, Moses stretched out his hand, and the, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and it made the sea land dry. So a lot, so many times in our minds we think when he done that, it just poof, it went out, it was there. But the Bible actually tells us that he bought a strong east wind, and it blew all night long, and it parted the sea. Now, this is where a lot of critics would come in and say, see, it wasn't supernatural. It was, it was just normal things. And there are places in the world where this has been observed, where the wind will blow, and it will push the water back, and even dry the ground in its own. And people will take that and say, well, see, it can happen. Listen. Whether or not it was natural or not, God caused it to take place. To me, to me, it doesn't, that does not take away from the supernaturalness of it at all. I think God could use something natural like that to do it if he could. I believe it was his supernatural power that done it, but he said he brought a strong east wind and it parted the sea and it dried the sea floor so that they could walk across on dry ground. Now that is very awesome to think about and why is it important that yeah it says they walked in the next verse it says and they uh and the children of israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them to the right hand and to their left hand they were a wall of water they were walking in the middle take for instance if you want to get a picture in your mind how many of y'all ever been to the aquarium Oh, yeah, that's exactly how it was like. I believe it was just like an awesome. They probably had a 21st century happening in the Old Testament. They were walking by, and I'm saying they were fish swimming by looking at them. I was like, what are y'all doing down here? Have y'all ever wondered what the fish think about us in the aquarium? I mean, when you walk by and they're swimming around and they're looking at all these people, like, how in the world did they get there? I think the same thing was happening right here. They were walking through, and these fish were swimming by on this wall, seeing all these people thinking, what's going on? I want to get to the other side, but I can't right now. It's cut off. But, I mean, it's a lot of different, that's kind of, that was exactly how it was happening. They may have could have even went up and put their hand in it. I don't know how I wasn't there. We can ask that when we get there. But uh, that's, they were walking through. Many critics will say this, too. Well, they, the place where they cross was actually not the Red Sea. It was just a big marshy area. There was only a couple inches of water, and that's how they crossed that. It, there you go. Absolutely. You ain't going to drown in two inch water. And if they did, that's a bigger miracle than parting the Red Sea, right? If he could drown Pharaoh's army in two inches of water, that's a bigger miracle than parting the Red Sea. So, yeah, but it absolutely had to be at least enough water, deep enough water, that the, the chariots couldn't, I mean, even like when it came back together and, and Pharaoh was in there, they could not touch ground. They drowned themselves because that's about what the Bible says. So many critics will say all those types of things. But we as believers believe that God is able to do whatever he wants to do, and we believe this. And I believe this literally. Literally, I believe the Bible. Can I say I'm a, oh no, I can't say that word, a literalist. I, I, I believe everything that my Bible says the way my Bible said it, okay? I don't have to go in and think, well, it, it says is, but it really means it. No, I believe what the Bible says, and the Bible says it parted the seas. That's exactly what I believe took place, and uh, they went across. They began to go across. It says, and it came to pass in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians, through the pillar of fire of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And they took and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel 
for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Notice this. He says he began to trouble them. He made their chariot wheels fall off. They began to have all these kind of things. And they said, somebody smartly said, we maybe need to leave them alone. Look what God's doing for them. This is what I wonder. Why did it just take right till now for somebody to say that? I mean, like, they done seen all the stuff that had happened in, in Egypt. They done seen the pillar of cloud make a barrier between them. Now the Red Sea is parted, and they're thinking, maybe we should just let them go. God's fighting for them. Every time that we've come against them, he's had an answer. Somebody who should have said, or some, somebody finally had enough sense to know that, but it was a little late in the story. But remember, Pharaoh's heart was what? Hardened. Because God had a plan. 26 said, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, and upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came to the sea after them. And there remained not so much as one of them. So they all drowned. Think, think about this. Those fish, they were, they were a wall of water. Those fish were swimming by, seeing them. And uh, they were saying, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, it comes back together, and those fish start swimming through, and there's horses, and there's chariots, and there's people in the water with them. And I, I can just think about those fish saying, well, what's going on now? What are these people doing in here? Those other people were outside. Now they're in here. So it must have been confusing to them. But it says, But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their left and their right hand. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses and always did everything that Moses said do for here on out. Is that what it says? No. Nah. We know the, the, the story. that And only what God had done for them didn't last a whole long. Right. But in this point, he, he took care of them. He saved them. They saw it. They give glory to God for it. The Egyptians were dead, and the reason they knew they were dead, they were washing up on the seashore. Sometimes God has to kill your enemy and let it wash up on the seashore before you truly believe that your enemy is gone. Listen, what do you think some people would have thought if they never seen them, if they just, the water, what would you think, some of them, would they really ever truly believed Pharaoh was gone? I think, look, they some of us that we 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 can see things that are clear as day and people in two minutes will come out and make a conspiracy theory about it. And listen, I'm a fan of those. I like conspiracy theories on a lot of things, but some things I'm like, man, it's clear as day, you know. Uh it, this is what happened. So they had to see with their own eyes to believe it so they could go forward with God. Sometimes God has to do that with us because we're so hard to believe it. The crossing of the Red Sea, one of the greatest stories in all the Bible. We hear those stories as little people and as people in Sunday school. We think about how awesome they are, but then we see all that God was doing in the midst of that. He wasn't just saving them. He was strengthening them. He was preparing them. He was making their faith grow a little bit. How many of y'all believe this and know this, that every time... God does something for you, it makes you a little bit more confident in God next time. Uh, even though we may not have the right amount of confidence, it does grow our faith and grow our confidence in, in what God can do. And that's what God is doing with the Israelites, and he'll never stop doing that. He'll never stop doing that with you. I'm way past time. Anybody got anything else tonight?
Not only did it, did, did they just disappear, but imagine how much that weakened that country at that moment. They were already weakened because of all the plagues. They lost a leader, lost their army. This is very interesting. Go back and, and do some research on uh, Egyptology. And around that time, if you, I, I believe it's true, if I can remember one of those things that we watched, it was trying to disprove those things. But there's a pharaoh that just kind of disappears off the scene. And uh, he didn't have a tomb. He didn't have a whole lot of anything said about him. He was pharaoh, and then pharaoh was gone in Egypt, Egyptian history. And uh, people are wondering, well, what happened to him? Well, I'll tell you what happened to him. He's in the Red Sea, amen? That, that was him. Uh, and it was all real. So those things happen. Anybody got anything else? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Mr. Cole to put those slides up next week for you. I got some slides that are really cool that you can see, kind of imagine that. But you're right. I mean, like, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. These are supernatural things that they were just living beside every day. That It was amazing. Make you feel very insignificant when you see that before you want it. Yeah. Yep. We 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 are just fleshly people. That's all we can say, and we're flawed uh, in that area. All right, let's stand our feet tonight. I know some of you got kids probably sitting out there waiting for you. Some of them running around in the parking lot. I'm just kidding. They don't let them do that. They don't let them do that. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Please come back and be with us Sunday. I'm excited about Sunday. God has given me a message I've been working on for a few weeks and uh, about the family. So if uh, you want to hear about that, please come back and be with us. Please come to Sunday school. Let's hit 150. Uh, seven, seven people. That's not very far away. If you were here last week, make sure you come back. Invite somebody to come with you. And uh, we'll hit that number. And uh, look, it's not about numbers, but there's goals that we can set, and that just getting more people into the into the house of God. But let y'all come back, be with us, and uh, looking forward to a great day of worship. Let's be dismissed.